Hello and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success podcast brought to you by SpratWith.com. I'm Vinay Koshin. Our guest is Stormy Andrews. Now, Stormy, you are the founder of Yokel Local. You're also an award-winning author uh, and have co-authored uh, books like Power of the Platform, Speakers and Success with Jack Canfield, Brian Tracy and Les Brown. More recently, of course, you've uh, released the world's best buy persona system, which we might get into. And you believe that's the first step in a uh, foundational step, at least, to outsmarting your competition. But uh, I'm curious, I believe you started out in your career as a salesperson, and you've been quite an accomplished salesperson. So how do you transition from doing that to starting a marketing agency? It's interesting, Vinay. I It was an accident. It wasn't planned. Right. And it was... Uh, I- Apparently, I had too much success in sales, not to pat myself on the back, but I was in the home building industry, and in the home building industry, I worked my way up from salesperson to sales manager, and then one day, I was recruited by an old boss of mine. He was the vice president of another home builder, and he said, Stormy, I want you to come work for me again, and I not only want you to be my sales manager, I want you to run our marketing department. So I thought about it for a second and I'm like running a marketing department. How hard could that be? And it was really the first time I had to work in my life. I should have stuck with sales. That was a lot easier. Marketing is where all the gray hair came from. So he started me down the path of marketing. I didn't know what I was doing initially. And I I was able to work myself through it. Then I became passionate in the world of digital marketing. And that's really when uh, marketing became exciting to me because when I was in the home building industry, this is pre-internet. So marketing was putting ads in newspapers and billboards and your traditional marketing mediums. And then comes along the internet and the rest is history. Certainly. So uh, was there something about the opportunities available via the uh, internet uh, that uh, really attracted you to this form of marketing? Initially, I didn't know what I was doing, but fortunately, no one else knew what they were doing either. (laughs) So it was okay. And I can go back and the experience of me not knowing what I was doing is really ultimately what led to the motivation for founding Yoko Local. In the home building industry, I needed someone to manage our website. So I hired some young kid. Matter of fact, I didn't hire. I found some kid that said he was a web developer and he ran our website. Social media didn't exist. But what did exist was SEO. We were at the beginning of paid ads. So I would hire these people that said that they knew how to take care and and run these things because I was intimidated. I didn't want to know how to do it. I was busy with everything else. And things weren't happening the way that they promised. And what I realized was when I pull them into a meeting and have a conversation, uh, they would all point fingers at one another. No one would accept responsibility. And because of my ignorance of this digital space, I didn't know who to believe. And usually it was the person that was the most well-spoken, which was usually the troublemaker. It got me in trouble. And that's what forced me down the path that I had to figure this stuff out. I had to learn it. And in short order, uh, I, you know, I had met my business partner um, at some point, but in short order, I started to realize that, Hey, this is, there's a lot of great information here. A lot of businesses could use the knowledge that I've been able to amass. And the cool thing about it was starting Yoko Local was we decided to be a full service marketing agency to to local businesses within our market. And we wanted to handle everything this way. If um, something didn't go as planned, there was one direction you can point fingers in and that was at us. And that was the, I, I didn't want business owners to experience what I experienced. So I'm like, you know what? I'm a pretty responsible person. I can put a great team together and I believe we can handle this, allow our clients to have the peace of mind knowing that things are going right. And if it isn't, well, they're, they only have to look in one direction. We can have a conversation uh, and we have no one to point our fingers at. Brilliant. So you've had quite a journey to date. So I'm also curious, uh, what would you say is your personal area of strength? Buyer personas. <laughs> That's where, <laughs> you know, and, and it's interesting. Let me tell you why buyer, pers- mm-hmm. buyer personas. But you had mentioned the first book that I participated in, which is Power of the Platform. Mm-hmm. And for readers of that book, 
I write on the topic of effective communication techniques. In the world of sales, it really isn't about selling. It's about, it, my belief, my mm -hmm. belief is it's not about selling. It's about really, uh, I believed in the world of consultative selling well before mm -hmm. consultative selling was a term. That's how I made my career in sales. And what I had to do better than everyone else, I had to be a better listener. I, I had to have empathy. And it's tough to truly have empathy if you're not listening to the pain points, the issues, the concerns of clients. But what I also had realized is oftentimes when people spoke, they weren't able to articulate their pain points, their issues, and really what the solutions were. And so having the ability of listening and probing and asking questions and taking customers down the path of them becoming clients of mine strictly from listening and custom tailoring my style of communication that was beneficial, you know, it was more beneficial to them instead of wanting them to adapt, paying attention to their body language, listening to the words that they use, were they, were the words that they use more visual words or auditory words or kinesthetic words and different cues in regards to even the way that they dress, not the mm -hmm just everything about them. I would pay attention to these things. And I did a pretty good job of custom tailoring my communication to their benefit. And when the, and within that book, my chapter was on effective communication techniques. And that's what I trained salespeople on prior to the world of marketing. When the world of digital marketing came along, I realized that the salesperson, which used to be the person that had the power because they had the information. Now the consumer is the person with the power, which is awesome because they hold the, all the information. But the problem was, these digital employees, which are websites, were lousy communicators, horrible communicators. They, they would typically communicate the way that they're programmed, and they were programmed by some tech or IT person, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but there wasn't the sufficient transference of knowledge from the people within the organization that had the knowledge to this digital employee, so it could be the best employee that it could be, uh, and deliver empathetic messaging to prospects that are on the website. And that's where the world's best buyer persona system came from. It's a process, unlike traditional buyer personas, it's a process that really helps you identify the pain points, the triggering events, the struggles, the emotions that your customers are going through, and then create a story and a narrative that's designed to connect with them. Because the realization is, Vinay, is that the first employee that someone will come across as it pertains to your brand oftentimes is your website. And if it's not treated as a digital employee, and if there isn't that necessary transference of knowledge to treat your customers as best as it can, the, the results may not be as effective as they can be. My, my passion was to take effective communication techniques when we're belly to belly, face to face, and do my best to train these digital assets, which have websites, social media, just all your messaging in general. And, and that's what led to the world's best buyer persona system. Excellent. So in that area of strength, I was going to ask you, what is something that businesses don't know, but should? <laughs> Obviously, it's finding the right messaging and being able to com communicate empathetically with, with their potential or future clients. Is there anything else that you would add to that? Yeah, what aware. <laughs> I want to go back to that transference of knowledge, if that's okay, mm -hmm. because that's an area that I see many businesses really missing the ball. And what I mean by that is, is the business owner, I'll take a small business as the example, because there are more small businesses than any other type. And a small business owner will start their business or they're running their business. Now, all of a sudden, they need to hire someone to take care of their SEO or their a website or their paid advertising or social media or what have you. The mindset of the business owner is, I hired a professional, they should be able to do a great job and take care of this marketing stuff. The marketing person is probably, let's assume that the marketing person is very good at doing what they're supposed to do based on the information that they have. And the marketing person may not be skilled at sitting the business owner down and saying, listen, I'm not going to do business with you if we can't get this transfer of knowledge because the marketing person wants to get a paycheck. So they're like, okay, I'll run with what I got and, and I'll just do it. Well, it's a disservice to both of them because typically what happens, whether it's six months or a year down the road, because that transference of knowledge hasn't taken place, what they were hired for doesn't meet the expectations that the business owner 
headset in their mind. And then the question, is it the marketing person's fault? Is it the business owner's fault? And, and I would say it's a little bit of both. What should have happened and what should happen moving forward. If, if you're a business owner listening to this, you should sit down with whoever's doing your marketing. If they're not achieving the results that you think they should be achieving is use a tool like the world's best buyer persona where you can transfer the knowledge of everything there is to know about your ideal customer, how they think and, and what they do and what's important to them. And then you're able to use a system like the world's best buyer persona system and you create a story narrative. And then that becomes a very powerful tool for anyone that's helping get your message across as to why you're the right solution provider or the, for some and the wrong solution provider for others. And it helps ensure that you don't get rid of the wrong person. You don't kill a strategy that's working simply because there hasn't been that adequate transference of knowledge. Vinay, did that explanation make sense the way I went through it? Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think that's key. My takeaway from that would be, even if you don't have a small business or, or you are actively recruiting to build an in-house team, it would be that you're, the person that you're entrusting with a job should be able to actively elicit information from you uh, and be able to elicit information from others within the organization as well in order to build more of a holistic uh, picture. Uh, and uh, I would probably extend that to customers and uh, vendors as well. No, I think that's vital because one of the topics I like to, or issues I like to highlight uh, in, in, in the podcast is the fact that uh, a lot of our listeners are executives or uh, founders of businesses who are quite keen on growing their businesses to fulfill their its true potential via remarkable experiences, be it via content or conversations. Uh, and this is a key element of that. In fact, I like the tagline that you've got. It's the, what, the world's best buyer persona system, the buyer persona reimagined. It's not who they are, but how they think. And I, I think a lot of businesses actually miss out on understanding how their customers think, because I've spoken to lots of SaaS businesses that have volumes of data, but it doesn't reveal how they think, uh, as in the clients think, and that's the issue. The funny thing there is, Vinay, you're absolutely correct. Oftentimes they approach their customers, not based on the way their customers think, but the way that they think, yeah. the company <laughs> themselves. And when you get into large organizations, here's where uh, that transfer of knowledge, be, transference of knowledge becomes super powerful. Imagine if you have a, when you have a larger organization, you tend to have different customer facing departments. Let's make it super simplistic. We've got a sales team and then we've got a customer service team and then you have a marketing division. And then maybe you have some outside vendors helping you along the way. When you have a really solid, just uh, uh, powerful buyer persona where it's written in a story narrative that when that transfer of, uh, transference of knowledge takes place and you share it with all the necessary customer facing departments and non customer facing departments, mm -hmm. but more importantly with your customer facing departments and your outside vendors, it allows and provides for this synergistic relationship. And it, it helps efficiency because we don't have to have meeting after meeting. Everyone uh, understands who you know, the ideal customers are. And you, you have this center, you end up with these synergistic components to where customer service scores tend to go up because now the customer service departments, they're, when they're doing their best to help the pain points of customers, at least they have a greater understanding of where the customer is coming from. That we put, we help the customer service departments have a relatable experience. What also happens is when you use the world's best buyer persona system, it allows the sales team and the marketing team to come together and do a better job of identifying what is the definition of a sales qualified lead versus mm -hmm. what is the definition of a marketing qualified lead. Oftentimes, there, those conversations haven't taken place. So now you have friction between those two departments because the marketing department feels the salespeople aren't doing their job. They can't close the book. The salespeople think the marketing people aren't doing the, their job because they're, they're, they're just sending a lot of leads that are non-qualified, no good leads to the sales department. When you use a world's best buyer persona system as your hub, it helps all of those areas collectively. And it doesn't have to be the world's best buyer persona system. It just needs to be some system just the world's best buyer persona system, I believe is the world's best. So why not that one? 
<laughs> certainly. And uh, you make a, a good point because um, if one were to Google by personas, there's a wealth of information. I think HubSpot, and I believe your 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 agency's a HubSpot Platinum partner, initiated the whole idea of by personas or customer personas. But from what I gather, your book is suggesting that we go further. That Correct. just looking at demographic information and a bunch of other interests and things of that nature is not enough. We need to get into the psychographics. And even right. more than that. But you're correct. If I were to tell you, Vinay, let's say if I said, hey, listen, Vinay, I've got someone that I think is a great prospect of yours. And if you were to tell me, oh, what is it, a, a 38-year-old female with 2.3 kids that drives a minivan that makes mm-hmm. you know $83,000 a year? Yeah. In reality, all that demographic stuff does mm-hmm. don't make decisions. People do. And when we get too heavy into the demographics, we start to forget we do business with people. In the B2B space, B2C space, we do business with people. And you have to do your due diligence to truly understand people. And when we get into the belief that the world's best buyer persona system, it's a a system about outsmarting your competitors, which leads to outgrowing and outselling. It's pretty simple. If you spend more time, energy, and effort understanding and learning as much as you can about the pain points, the struggles, the motivations, the noise that your ideal customers see, the better your position to get ahead of the noise, the better your position to create messaging that's going to be relatable, the better you're going to be to get involved with their journey earlier in the process. So you end up with the situation over time to where oftentimes you can eliminate the competition purely because they never become part of the equation. You got into this relationship early before you even know or knew that you were part of the the equation Mm -hmm. because you were so focused on your ideal clients that they were picking up on your messaging, whether it be your blog post, your podcast, your videos, your white papers, your downloads, tools that were helping them along the the journey. And when you do it well, there's nothing like it. It's pretty incredible, Vinay. You touched upon, uh, I guess, an issue that um, uh, a lot of companies of different sizes have encountered over time, which is they probably outsource part or uh, perhaps most of their marketing to an agency. And yet I've spoken to lots of folks who have churned through quite a few, uh, simply saying that they're incapable of doing what was expected of them. Is the issue incompetence or would you see it as more of an expectation issue? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of good agencies that get fired. And there are a lot of good companies that fire. There are good and bad agencies, good and bad agencies that get fired. And there are times when incompetent agencies should have gotten fired, but they're allowed to continue. Mm -hmm. And there are times that very competent agencies are getting fired because of some misalignment in regards to expectations. And what I've come to the belief is that the expectation conversation that needs to happen at the very beginning, it's so important. And oftentimes it doesn't happen. And sometimes from the agency perspective, either they don't ask for it or when they do, and the business says, listen, we're busy. We don't have time. Just figure it out. Run with it. And the agency, because of not wanting to lose the the deal or lose the contract, they just roll with what they have. It's a mistake on both parties. Someone needs to step up and take leadership and let's set the expectations. Let's set the rules of the game. Let's define what a win looks like. Let's define what a loss looks like. How can you enter into a relationship? And if you think about it, the world of marketing, it's a game. And if we're going to play a game and if we don't know what a win looks like and a loss looks like, how do we know if we're winning or losing? And one of the things that I like to do when I sit down with organizations and I'm consulting organizations, I'm like, okay, let's do this. Let's break your marketing down into eight areas. There's eight areas that I want to look at. And then let's grade you on those eight areas. And, and I'll share those with you in just a second, Vinay, if that's okay. Sure. But let's grade you on a scale of uh, uh, A, B, C, D, E, or an F. And then once we grade you, if you're not an A, if, well, if you do rate yourself an A, let's find out why you are an A, what that means. If you're an F, let's 
find out what an A would look like, but let's also find out what a B, a C, and a D would look like, because it would be a mistake to have the expectation that we're going to move you from an F to an A overnight. How about a win would be from an F to a D? Would that be considered a win, right? And then a D to a C, that would be another win. And then let's look at the timelines. Let's define that. Let's figure out the tools and tactics we're going to use. And let's have a written strategy. So the point that I want to get there before I share with you the eight areas, for each of the eight areas that they score themselves on, we have to have three elements for all eight of those areas. Element number one, we have to have a, a written strategy. What's the strategy that we're going to employ for that one eighth of your marketing plan? We need to have KPIs, meaning what's the definition of a win? We, you know, <laughs> what does it look like? And then what yeah. tools and tactics are we going to use? Let's identify those types of scenarios. And once we have that, we can use the world's best buyer persona as the hub. So let me share the eight areas with you. Sure. So the first component is awareness. Are strangers aware of your brand? If, when they're in need of your goods and services, are you an A through an F? I'll have them rate themselves and whatever the score is, let's figure out what the strategy is going to be to get to the next highest grade. What tools and tactics are we going to use and what's the definition of a success? So awareness category, number one, the next category would be engagement. Are people engaging with whatever act? Sorry, I was just um, uh, wanting to ask, uh, is that, both sides have a common understanding of how best to qualify these the grade. Is there a, a metric or, or standard by which both parties would, would agree that this is an A or an F or something in between? That's where the expectation comes in. Right. Initially, I like to have the organization self-assess. And then once right. they self-assess, because remember... <laughs> They're the ones that get to set the grade. So let's have right. you self-assess. And, and then it's just a matter of why is that? You've given yourself a C or okay. a B or an A. Why is that? What would the next level look like to you? Okay. What would the next the step before look like to you? So self-assessing works out great as long as you follow it up with why is that? Okay. Yeah, right. And so after awareness, the next level is engagement. Whatever opportunities you give people that are familiar with your brand to engage with you, how is that working? And then from engagement, then there's lead generation. From lead generation, the next category is conversion optimization. And the next category is wow. Now, wow is something where well, the first categories I mentioned, you probably said, okay, awareness, I get that. Engagement, I get this. Lead generation, conversion optimization, I'm with you. But what's this wow thing you're talking about? Wow is an incredible opportunity that many businesses and organizations miss out on. And here's wow. Especially if you have a considered purchase. If I'm looking to have a substantial investment with you, chances are I've been thinking about this for a while. I've been doing some research and I'm, I've been debating between you as a vendor and someone else as a vendor and company A and company B and all these other things. If you can imagine, there's probably some tension on my end as the consumer of your goods and services, irrespective of it's B2B or B2C, but I'm the first time consumer of your goods and services, there's some tension. What systems and processes do your organization, does your organization have in place that's designed to bring down that tension immediately after the person signs the contract, gives you the credit card, to make them feel warm and fuzzy and confirm the fact that they've done business with the right company? Oftentimes, many organizations, they haven't thought about that. They're like, hey, we, we get the contract and we just move it down the process. If you can in, in, improve that wow experience for the people that immediately on board with you, if you can turn that into a wow experience, that's a tremendous opportunity. From the psychological standpoint, your customer feels that a beautiful relationship has just begun. They chose to do business with you. But oftentimes, from the company standpoint, we treat it as if, where a beautiful relationship has just ended because we're too busy to move them down the pipeline. So whether it's a handoff or whatever that process is, it really needs to be taken under a microscope because it can always be improved. So we have wow. And then from wow, that's immediately after the sale happens, the, the next area is to look at is something called the customer ladder. And within the customer ladder, we're going to use my definition of a customer and our, the levels are the rungs of the ladder. And the first rung of the ladder is a customer. That's someone that they needed your goods and services. They decided to do business with you. What if you had systems and processes in place that takes that customer and you were really focused on having them become clients? 
in clients, meaning that if they ever needed your goods and services again, or if a colleague or friend or family needed your services, that they're more likely to re send others your way. You will be first of mind. A client is more powerful than that of a customer. But what's better than a client? That would be an advocate. An advocate is someone that is in your corner. Price becomes less of a concern. They're more concerned about the value proposition that you bring to the table, and they will definitely tell others about you. Even better than an advocate is a raving fan. You see a raving fan, they can't even imagine not doing business with you. They couldn't imagine others not doing business with you. Those are the individuals that are on street corners singing your organization praises. Any good organization is going to have an organic process where people naturally migrate through the process, and it just happens organically. But if you turn that into a system by putting better efficiencies and processes and training in place, where if you increase your cus more customers to becoming clients and clients becoming advocates and advocates become raving fans, it's extraordinary what it does to the bottom line mm -hmm. for everyone involved. It's a very powerful system. So that's the customer ladder. The next area we look at, reviews and testimonials. How do you compare to others in your space in terms of quantity and quality? And then how are you doing in terms of referrals? Those are the eight areas. And those eight areas I actually call a, a success wheel, a marketing success wheel. Once a business and an agency, they evaluate those items. The next thing to do is look at what area of those areas can we have the most the, the, the greatest impact immediately. And once that's determined, expectations can be set. I think it's in, almost impossible for ex expectations to be set before then. And let's say if a company says they're a C, okay, let's sit down at the table and let's figure out what a B looks like. Let's figure out how long it's going to take us to get to a B. Let's figure out what tools and tactics we're going to use. And let's put out a written strategy. If we can agree on that, there's no reason that firing should take place because now management and ownership can see that there's a progression towards whatever's laid out, right? Mm -hmm. Expectations have been set. And even if they're not, if the targets aren't hit, at least they can show progress because sometimes even with, with the best intentions and all the right tools and all the right tactics, sometimes you just don't hit the mark. But at least if you can document what has happened and why it's transparent, it gives you the ability of shifting and moving and modifying. And I know that was a mouthful, Vinay. I threw a big, <laughs> long chunk of information yeah. and, uh, hopefully the audience was able to say, hey, man, <laughs> they didn't have to say slow down a little bit. And, and hopefully it made sense to everyone. No, it's, that was great. I think you've provided a very more of a granular approach to how we should approach marketing across the entire customer journey, uh, as opposed to what perhaps a lot of agencies do, which is to talk about specific tactics, be it SEO, PPC, etc., and use that as a basis for the assumption that it will uh, provide a company traction. This is more holistic. You can customize your strategy and approach, uh, and at times even say that this is not in my wheelhouse. We'll, we'll need to bring in a, a, another party to solve a particular issue. And that's key if there is to be a win on both sides. That's, that's terrific. Thank you for that. Obviously, underpinning all of this is the by a persona that you're talking about, would that be correct. correct? Yeah. One of the challenges most businesses and perhaps even agencies would have is that businesses come up with personas, usually because someone in the marketing department or someone suggested it would probably be a good idea to do that. It, it gives us an avatar. And so we have things like Sally Sales and cute names like that that describe some of these custom avatars. Is that enough? You, sure, it, uh, it helps to be able to understand them, uh, uh, but would you suggest that a better approach would be to take a specific customer that exhibits the kinds of characteristics that we know are profitable to the business and use that as more of a benchmark than just those silly, arbitrary names that we come up with at times in, in some organizations at the brain? Absolutely. And it's cool to use the names, but you mm -hmm. hit the nail right on the head. The gold standard, for creating a buyer persona in my mind is getting your very best customers together in a room and then going through the right. questions that are outlined in, in, in the, the framework that I've laid out in the world's best buyer persona system. You can ask them the questions. That's the gold standard. But oftentimes it's difficult to get them in a room. So you have to use your customer facing departments. So having a basic buyer persona, yeah, I, I, it's, it's better than nothing. But my experience has been the first time I used a buyer persona was when I was in the home building industry. 
And what I realized was I created a buyer persona because I, I'm in charge of sales and marketing and our land development team would buy a chunk of land. They buy 20 acres hmm. and they're like, okay, Stormy, we, we're looking to buy this piece of land. We're putting in an offer. Now we need you to go determine what uh, size homes we should build on the land based on the guidelines of the zoning restrictions, but what size homes, what price points, what features. So I had to build these buyer personas that were purely based on market conditions and it was a different type of buyer persona. But what I realized was that the buyer personas that I created for the land development department didn't help my sales. I didn't have anything that I had very little information that I was able to give my sales team that and because I was in that u- unique position involved on both sides, that was I realized that the buyer persona was great, but when I was done with it, it sat on a shelf and collected dust. It just wasn't strong enough. It wasn't good enough. And the reason I had those eight elements of, of the marketing success will, because when you create it and, and you make a will out of it, the world's best buyer persona sits at the hub. Because if you want to have a significant impact on any of those eight areas that I have identified, you should know as much about your customer as you can. If you, in any of those areas, you should know their pain points, their issues, their motivations, their triggering events. You should know all of that. And once you know that information, now it gives you the ability of putting a better strategy together and, and ensure that you're using the right tools and that you're setting realistic KPIs. It's tough to even set KPIs or OKRs or whatever your measurement is. It's tough mm-hmm. to really put those in place if they're not based on the motivations of your customers and the desires and the drives of, of your customer, because now you're looking at it incorrectly. You're looking at it purely from a, oh, let me back up. You're looking at it incorrectly if customer service and world-class service is important to you. Excellent. Did I even answer the question or did uh, I? I'd, I'd love it if you could uh, unpack this a little bit more. So uh, with the persona, you're trying to get into the heads of uh, these potential customers. What sort of motivations should we try to elicit from potential customers and and customers if we've got them in the room and trying to talk to them? Run that. I want to make sure I understand the question properly. Um, uh, Uh, I can answer it, but I'm not sure sure. if I'm answering the right question. Sure. Let me put it a bit more simply if I can. How do we understand their motivations? What what are the sorts of questions that would reveal their motivations. Now, I'm a fan of jobs to be done. I'm I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but uh, it's a process where we unpack the the role that a person holds within the company and not just their title, but the functional duties on a daily basis, even every quarter or uh, on a yearly basis, uh, and then unpack how that affects their day to day. Absolutely. Because somewhere in there is the pain. Now, I was wondering if you use a similar approach or something yeah. a bit different. I use Maze Law's hierarchy of needs. Okay. So we run, when you use the world's best buyer percentage system, we're, uh, we're comparing that against Maze Law's buyer, uh, hierarchy of needs. It's a pretty good tool. It's been around for a while, but if that's the primary external tool that we're using when we're looking at the needs that are that need to be met. And we're combining that with some elements of NLP. My background's in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, but we use some elements of NLP combined with Maze Law's hierarchy of needs when we're working on the needs and motivations that need to be met. So for instance, using your example, let's say if it's a B2B space and the person is a a purchasing manager and they've been working with a provider of services for umpteen years and now they're looking to change or they're not happy with the purchasing matter, or, you know, with, the, with, with their vendor for whatever the reason may be, and they would like to make a change. But maybe everyone else isn't on board. Th- this could be a decision that could be life-changing for them, meaning that if they get it wrong, they may find themselves in the unemployment line. <laughs> <laughs> if they get it right, maybe they believe that they're in line for an employ- an, um, uh, a promotion. Now, we're looking at their belief systems. It doesn't matter if their belief systems are accurate or inaccurate. We're human, so oftentimes our belief systems are inaccurate. But understanding their belief systems, that I'm a, I, I want to change because this purchasing manner, this vendor is causing us all sorts of grief. No one's aware of it except for me. And now I want to propose a radical change. Well, the need that needs to be met for that person is the strongest need on Maze Law's hierarchy of needs would be safety. They are going to choose a vendor and there needs to be a message of safety in regards to your company or your organization. Why are you safe for them? Why is it that 
no one has ever been fired by choosing your company Mm -hmm. as the preferred vendor. Uh, And having a message that people only get fired a portion of the time by choosing us probably isn't the right messaging or Mm -hmm. not even addressing it isn't the right messaging. Oftentimes we may see organizations create messaging that's about esteem or love and belonging. They're they're, they're creating messaging that's based on the wrong needs that need to be met. And that's where Maze Law's hierarchy of need comes in to be a pretty effective tool for that. In, in a B2B situation, nowadays, we find that there are multiple parties involved in, in yes. making a purchase decision. How would you recommend we apply the persona, uh, persona system that you, you've been describing into such situations? Do we create as many profiles as, as required, or uh, is there another way of thinking about this? Yeah, usually there's two. There's the person that's the initial gatherer of information mm-hmm. and then there's the initial then there's the final decision makers right two different motivations so normally i look at those two how can we assist the person that is charged with gathering the initial information and then if you have the persona for them you're likely to attract them but if you use and expect the information and the messaging that uh, and, and the tools that you provided that person to move up chain, it's probably not going to be effective because the person or the group up chain have different motivations. So the goal is to create essentially two personas, one for the person who's gathering the information, another for the decision makers, and create the tools and the resources for both parties. And then you're also providing the gather of information. You're nightly, you're nicely packaging that information that they need with a bow so they can pass it on. And, and they can also be your biggest advocates because with, especially when it's high end B2B sales, we want to make their life easy. And in order to make their life as easy as possible, the information gatherer, you've got to work a little bit harder It's not than, than your competitors in regards to, to make their life easier. It doesn't happen any other way. Mm-hmm. Tell me if I'm, I'm uh, on the right track here, but are you suggesting that uh, whether it be a CRM or some other system, we need to almost um, uh, be comparing where people are at uh, in their journey along yep. with the compatibility with our buyer personas? Is, is that some sort of, okay, how would you best do that? Because most people would have a CRM system with the basic sales type information or some marketing uh, notes and uh, related information. But um, and I'm thinking of my experience with Salesforce and a couple of other systems, I would imagine there would be a lot more required to to create uh, that kind of information and make it available on a regular basis. Yeah. yeah. So what happens when it comes down to the the custom properties within the CRM? In, in the three stages that I promote within the world's best buyer persona system is awareness, consideration, and decision. And that particular persona may have different motivations different needs, different uh, triggering events in all three of those areas. And the, but, but it still follows, you know, a similar path, but with the use of custom properties within the CRM, if, if you use my system and awareness and consideration decision stage, that is a very simplistic way of doing it because if we overcomplicate it. The danger that we run into is it doesn't get used. It's not sure. yeah. effective. I like to keep it simple. And I think those three work fairly well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but then if, if it does require sales people and sales people involved, it could be as simple as having an awareness consideration decision stage and having a, a set of notes that are situated with those three stages. Why is that? Why is this person in the consideration stage? What are their pain points? How does it align to you know our company's belief systems or our methodologies or, mm-hmm. or, or whatever we have in place? But it gives the ability to for management or that person to easily or more easily navigate the sales process. Did that help? Or did yeah, I even complicate yeah. it even more? Because uh, when we add a CRM, <laughs> we can complicate it even more. I agree with you on that one. <laughs> no, that, that's uh, great. And I think it provides at least a basic framework by which to apply it. Hopefully that's uh, useful. Another question I had was who should be involved in developing these buyer personas? There's a lot of information within the organization across the various departments or teams, as we might call it. Usually, a CMO is in charge of the marketing side of things, but is that where the role should lie, or should there be someone else who advocates 
for by personas and re- not reviews, I would call it reviews of the buyer persona on a regular basis. Yeah. I think ultimately when the buyer persona is created, I think you should have representatives from your customers facing departments, right. the people on the front line, they have the information. It, it, it's if you have, whether it be your customer service department, your, the departments that answer the phones, the sales department, the marketing department, but any departments that you have that are customer facing, having them part of the conversation is valuable because they all see a different, they see different sides of the same coin, that coin Mm -hmm. being your customer. They have valuable information to bring to the table. As a matter of fact, the least valuable person is typically the executives because (laughs) they're far away. They're important Mm -hmm. to lead the conversation to be a part of the equation, but the value comes from your frontline people. Okay. And obviously underpinning this is the whole idea of trust. Could you expand or provide your perspective on on how you're fostering uh, trust through this entire process? It's easy. Think about this for just a moment. Any interpersonal relationship. If I were to spend time, Vinay, to get to know you better, ask you questions, show concern, empathy. Mm -hmm. One, it's difficult for me to show concern and empathy for your plight and your issues if I don't know anything about you, if I'm not spending the time, energy, and effort. Just the fact of doing that builds trust. Mm -hmm. It's an an, an incredibly simple thought process, but for some reason, it's in this fast-paced world, we don't want to do it. If you've ever been to a networking event, we think about the person at a networking event that just wants to come and throw up and vomit all their information as to why they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. All we want to do is run. We've been there and and maybe we've been guilty of it at times, but occasionally you get a person that you meet and you're like, man, I just, I don't know what it is about this person, but I really like them. And, and, And maybe it was because they had thoughtful questions they were able to share relatable experiences with you based on the questions that they asked. They were able to, they paid enough attention to where they're able to match your tonality and, 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 and body language. And, and you, there was just rapport that was built where they got a chance to know you, you got a chance to know them, you got a chance to like them, they got a chance to like you, and you got a chance to trust each other. And it doesn't happen instantaneously. If I walk into Starbucks tomorrow and I see I'm engaged, so I don't want my fiance to hear this, but let's say if I walk into Starbucks tomorrow and I see the most beautiful creature in the world and we glance eyes and and two minutes later, I'm over on my knees proposing to her. One, I got problems when I get back home with my fiance, right? But two, (laughs) there are stages of human intimacy. There is a book by Desmond Morris called The 12 Stages of Human Intimacy. And it's more about interpersonal relationships. And there's a lot of value in that book as it pertains to business. Businesses don't necessarily have 12 stages of the human intimacy, but, but there are stages that we need to go through. And if we skip one of those stages, we're damaging the trust. And I think the, the world's best buyer persona system forces you to start thinking a little bit differently than you have in the past. And with those different provocative thoughts and exercises, it allows you to tweak the way you Uh, get to know your customers, but more importantly, the way that they get to know you. So we're giving them the opportunity to like you and trust you and oftentimes speed up the sales process because you were able to get into trust and rapport much faster. This has been uh, terrific. Is there anything else that you feel we should know about when it comes to buy personas and developing these and, and certainly reviewing them and keeping them up to date? Yeah, I would. The world changes. And oftentimes people ask me, they're like, Stormy, how often should I change or update or modify my buyer persona? And my answer to that is often as needed. (laughs) Sometimes there are events that happen, world events. We just, we we, we had a a funny, uh, not a funny one, but we had a world event that happened in 2020 that that shook the world, that changed the trajectory for a lot of people. Chances are your, the motivations of your prospects have changed. That would have been a good time to revisit your buyer personas. But within industries change, local politics and uh, supply line issues, there are many things that can affect the motivations, desires, and needs of, of, of your ideal prospects. So it is something that I would recommend 
especially when it's put in a story narrative, that's also one of the keys of the world's best buyer persona system. I have a lot of people that use like story brand from Donald mm-hmm. Miller, a great process. Yeah. They use that process in their marketing, but they use the world's best buyer persona for their character development, which it's a great complement to that mm-hmm. particular system. And then they'll, and, and by having that story narrative, you can go back and review the story and you ask yourself, has anything changed? You know what? A few things have. Let's modify it. Let's update it. Let's add to it. And it becomes this living, breathing document. It's not a, a document that is designed to be built. And you're like, this is it. It's never going to change. Mm-hmm. That would be crazy because people do change. So uh, as it pertains to the buyer persona, if you have it, it should be a living, a living breathing document. People change. Your customers change. This document is built and designed to change right along with it. Would you say that as part of the buyer persona, we should also take into account how an understanding of how uh, your clients are responding to competitors in the marketplace and perhaps other uh, related industries as well? Absolutely. You want to, you definitely want to look at the noise in the marketplace, in Mm -hmm. the marketplace that would fall under noise. How you may have some competitors that are doing an exceptional job. Why is that? That would be the question again. Why are they doing a job that's considered exceptional and yours isn't? Why do do you believe yours is exceptional and theirs isn't? And that's usually the misnomer. Uh, A lot of organizations start drinking their own Kool-Aid and they think they're the best things in sliced bread. And they're like, no one does it as well as we do. Mm -hmm. No one. And if I go to the other company, they say, no one does it as well as we do. I'm like, okay, something's file here. So understanding what's happening with your competitors. And if you think about it this way, let's say if we're in this experiential economy, what can you do to ensure that your experience is unlike any other in your industry? And let's look at a couple of case studies for just a moment. Let's look at Amazon. Amazon disrupted retail as we know it. Amazon, prior to Amazon, I would order something online or from a catalog or wherever I ordered from. And if I got it in a week, I was thrilled, thrilled. Then it turned into three days delivery. And I'm like, I'm getting something in three days. This is incredible. How do they do it? Then it went to two day delivery, then one day delivery. But hey, let me tell you something. On Sunday, this past Sunday, I ordered some Harney and Sons tea, a $13 bag of tea with 15 packets in there. So I'm just, and this happened this past Sunday. I woke up in the morning. I realized I was out of tea uh, or I had a couple of tea bags left and I was going to be out, not have enough for tomorrow. So I'm like, let me go to Amazon and order some tea. It was at, man, I showed my fiance the time frame, but basically that tea showed up at my house within three hours. How yeah. incredible <laughs> is that, right? How incredible. And you think about Amazon and if you look at other companies that are disrupting and disruption, by the way, typically comes from the outside because organizations are too busy drinking their Kool-Aid. So -hmm. let's look at Amazon disrupted retail from the outside. Tesla, they weren't a car manufacturer, but they're disrupting the automotive industry. Motorola and Nokia should have been the inventors of the iPhones, but Apple was from the outside. Uber should have been invented by the taxi cab companies but it wasn't. Airbnb should have been invented by the hotel industries. It wasn't. You see what happens within organizations, there are, which I like to tell organizations, right now there are three college kids in a dorm room someplace looking to disrupt you. And uh, they're looking to disrupt you by providing a superior customer experience. And the question is, are you going to continue to do the way you always have done it? Or are you going to say, let me get serious about my customer. Let me figure out a way that I can disrupt myself. This way I become the disruptor because regardless of the industry you're in, you make the choice. Are you going to be the disruptor or the disrupted? It's your call. And the world's best buyer persona is just a tool that helps you either A, become the disruptor or at least build an incredible moat to where it makes it very difficult for that disruptor to come in and disrupt you. As you were saying that, and I was thinking back to in the earlier bit piece that you were, where you were talking about empathy and, and sh- showing empathy by the questions you ask and the, the conversations we have, would I be right from your perspective, compassion to that equation? Uh, yes. Simply because compassion, uh, I think, leads to action and action solidifies the impressions that we have or begin to form about a, a person or a company or a brand. Absolutely. You can absolutely add compassion because it's difficult to have one without the other. Mm -hmm. You can't have empathy without compassion. And you could have 
compassion for someone. And so we just see a little bit, but it's difficult to have compassion without empathy, without compassion, which is a lot different than sympathy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I think um, that's a key part to creating the kinds of experiences and the disruptors we've been, we've been seeing. It's that there's a level of compassion there with some of these disruptors in trying to provide these new experiences that really speaks to uh, customers. Thanks for that. No, this has been uh, terrific, Stormy. To wrap things up, if you were listening to this episode, what would you say would be your top takeaway? If I was listening to the episode, my top takeaway, I'm coming from a very selfish position. My top takeaway <laughs> is, let me go buy a copy of the Audible and the book. Let me do both. But, <laughs> but the top takeaway, let's take that out of the equation. The top takeaway is, I, I think the area where I see the, the greatest opportunity. I'm fortunate enough where I get to meet with dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of business owners annually. And it's, it's transference of knowledge usually doesn't happen sufficiently. And then also within organizations, something we didn't get into is that a lot of these organizations have what I call half-built bridges. That's where the success marketing will comes into place. Uh, it helps you identify some initiatives that maybe you started that you hadn't completed. And it, it's, and, and if you have something that's 80% done, maybe the first thing you should look at is completing that. Let's get that on a solid foundation before you start diving into building more half-built bridges just to add to your inventory of stuff that you started and didn't finish. So uh, if I was on the outside looking, I think the greatest takeaway is having greater understanding, putting more emphasis and understanding your customers so you can serve them better and and, and then putting a, a process and systems in place so you can do that so it's more than just words and to uh, just uh, dive a little bit at least into the uh, uh, area of half-built bridges that would be something that would come post the what was it the marketing success wheel uh, yep. and in the form of an audit of what's currently in place and currently correct. happening yep that's absolutely uh, correct yep. okay uh, so stormy this has been terrific. Hopefully we've uh, provided a bit more of an insight into buyer personas. Uh, if listeners are curious and wanted to find out more, uh, where could they head to or even connect with you? Yeah. I'm also assuming, uh, well, I, mean, I, I know the book is available on Amazon and other major retailers, I'm assuming as well. Yep. Yeah, but I made it super simple. If you want any of the stuff that we talked about today, go to outsmarttools.com. Okay. If you go to Outsmart Tools, when you arrive there, there's a free exercise where you can do your own marketing successful. I have a series of videos where I'll walk you through each of those eight areas where we can spend 15 minutes together, or at least you're spending 15 minutes with a recorded video that I've done to walk you through that process and get you that. There's links there to get a copy of the book. There's information there, my contact information. So yeah, Outsmart Tools, that's a, a, a URL that just has a link tree with various links to grab a hold of anything that we talked about today. A lot of free resources there too. Okay, brilliant. I'll uh, include that in the show notes. Stormy, thank you so much for doing this. Awesome, Vinay. It was a pleasure. I had an awesome time with you. <laughs>